The nuclear deal of July 14 marked the breakthrough in U.S.-Iran relations, and while critics remain fiercely opposed to the deal, Iran's return to the international scene offers inspiring opportunities for the Middle East. The United States has had trouble reading Iran since the break in diplomatic relations in 1980, a basic lack of understanding compounded by missed signals at critical junctures, deepened estrangement and set back efforts to build relations. Our guest in our program is Dr. Hali Vaziri, a PhD in the Middle East and North Africa studies. Hali, welcome to our program. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be with you. Well, U.S. President Barack Obama has signed an order directing his administration to take steps towards lifting sanctions on Iran in accordance with the July nuclear accord. What's your comment about that, Dr. Halley? Well, uh, it's definitely an interesting development which shows a lot of promise, particularly in terms of the opening of Iran's economy. Uh, Iranians are almost 80 million people, and they are very consumer-driven, and they've been cut off from the world for quite some time. So there's an eagerness to reconnect with the world, and particularly the international economy, both to mm -hmm. export their products and also to import what the world has to offer. It seems that Iran and the United States have finally found some common ground, haven't they? Yes, uh, I, I think it's the beginning of mm -hmm. common ground, but I would also add that the ground is a bit shaky, uh, mm -hmm. both within the United States and inside Iran. There are opponents to this slow rapprochement, mm -hmm. if you can call it that, or to the nuclear accord itself. Nevertheless, just this week, the supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei gave his blessing mm -hmm. to the nuclear deal. Uh, that was a promising sign, but at the same time, he also urged what he called, quote-unquote, vigilance, saying that the Islamic Republic cannot trust the United States. So it's, uh, it's common ground, but I would add that it's shaky ground. Yeah, adding to that, uh, well, he must face the discontent of uh, the Republicans, and into that the Israeli government as well. Yes, absolutely. It's, uh, it's shaky on both sides. President Obama surely has uh, a difference of opinion with Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, who sees Iran's pursuit of a nuclear program as a serious, if not existential, threat. Uh, even though Israel itself has its own nuclear program, which is uh, far superior in, in number to anything that Iran or anyone else mm -hmm. in the region possesses. Uh, more serious on the home front for President Obama is the opposition of Republicans and of a few key Democrats who have been critical of the nuclear accord, uh, arguing that uh, it does not sufficiently protect Israel, uh, nor can the Iranians, the Iranian leadership, be trusted to implement the accord. There's fear of, of cheating. So mm -hmm. while for the most part uh, there is Republican opposition, there's also some significant uh, Democratic opposition. Democrats in Congress who are mm -hmm. well known for siding with the president on other issues but who have uh, serious concerns with regard to foreign policy. Iran happens to want Daesh terrorists eliminated just about everyone. Yes, that's correct. Uh, from the point of view of the Iranian government, um, Daesh, uh, or the Islamic State, as, as it's known here in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, is, is really an existential threat. Uh, it's a... Uh, some would say it's a it's a battle of Islamic ideology. Um, mm -hmm. Iran 
claiming for itself the mantle of a universalist vision of Islam that it has sought to export since the revolution, um, but in fact being a principally uh, Shia Muslim state, uh, whereas Daesh, of course, uh, is uh, the enforcer or the propagator of a very strict understanding of Sunni Islam. Of course, I'm, I'm oversimplifying somewhat. Yeah. Uh, but in that respect, just ideologically speaking, they're opposed to one another. Uh, then there's also the issue of the fact that Daesh operates in countries um, that are very close to Iran, particularly Iraq. And so uh, from the Iranian point of view, uh, it's a threat that sits right at its borders. Uh, mm -hmm. And then Iran has its ally in Bashar al-Assad in, in uh, Syria and certainly does not want to see that alliance squandered by a, a takeover um, mm -hmm. by what it considers to be um, extremists. So from its point of view, Daesh is really a mortal enemy. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Vazir, how do you see Iran coming back into the international community? Well, I, I think uh, it will be very mixed. Uh, mm -hmm. From the outside, at times, it will look perhaps a little maddening because it'll be two steps forward and two steps back. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say this is because there are serious divisions within the Iranian government as yeah. to how far forward uh, the Islamic Republic wishes yeah. to go, not just in dealing with the United States, but with yes. the world at large, and particularly with the Western world. I think there's more agreement mm -hmm. between uh, what you would call the reformist faction and the principalist faction inside Iran. The principalists are what are often called the hardliners. Uh, there is more agreement between them about engaging the rest of the world. For example, uh, China, Japan, or the Arab world. There's a, a sense that Iran has to come out of its isolation and that cooperating with other non-Western countries would be a very good start. But when it comes to the West, and particularly the United States, there is serious division inside the Iranian government as to what that cooperation should look like. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also note that, to some extent, civil society inside the Islamic Republic will be driving the leadership. There's a very strong demand, particularly amongst young people and amongst business people, that Iran should escape international isolation. There are many mm -hmm. business opportunities to be had, and people inside Iran do not want to miss the chance to export their products, particularly oil, of course. Mm -hmm. And young people inside Iran really wish to reconnect to the rest of the world. And that, that pressure... Mm -hmm. Yes. will only build. And I think that, uh, well, certainly the president of Iran, Hassan Rouhani, is sensitive to that pressure. And he was really elected, not just on a promise of uh, dealing with a nuclear issue, but restoring Iran's economy to some sort of soundness and sane policy. Mm -hmm. And even though uh, Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei could technically veto uh, Rouhani's decisions, he himself is not entirely immune from uh, public pressure. He remembers well what happened in 2009 when uh, the election of uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was considered fraudulent and Iranians poured into the streets and actually started saying, you know, death to the dictator death to Khamenei. He does not want a repeat of that scenario. So he cannot entirely divorce himself from uh, public pressure in that respect. Well, some said it will become an Eldorado for business. Yes, th there are um, many efforts to open Iran in terms of making it more business friendly. Uh, certainly the business community inside Iran is 
taking very active steps in this regard. And even Iranians outside Iran, um, what you might call the diaspora, have set up organizations to facilitate um, interaction between Iranians in country um, and other other business people from abroad. In fact, there's a, a very unique organization called I Bridges, which is mm -hmm. precisely meant to do this kind of work. Uh, okay. So I, I am cautiously optimistic in, in this regard that the Iranian economy will benefit from these kinds of efforts. Uh, but I would also note that Yes. Between economic isolation for the last 30 plus years and also the severe economic mismanagement of uh, President Ahmadinejad's administration, the previous administration in Iran, mm -hmm. and then you know, just corruption, endemic corruption, there's a lot that needs to be cleaned up inside Iran in terms of rules and regulations for business. Uh, for outsiders to be able to, first of all, just understand the Iranian economy, which is highly complex, but also to be able to operate within that economy. And I, I really think that in this case, uh, that business people themselves will be at the forefront of trying to uh, clean up the economy and to work with President Rouhani and his advisors to make the laws more consistent and business friendly. Uh, I also think, on the other hand, that they, they will face opposition because of precisely what you said, that mm -hmm. uh, it will change the country. And there are some, you know, conservative, more isolationist forces inside Iran who will worry uh, and, and not, not entirely without justification that opening Iran up uh, will expose Iranians to other cultures and ideas, and mm -hmm. that you cannot open up an economy without without opening up the politics of a country. So I, I think it'll be a very interesting and exciting time in terms of business, but there there will also be uh, hesitation mm -hmm. on the part of political forces to open up entirely. Well, Dr. Vaziri, a last question. Do you see a change in the balance of power in the Middle East with the coming back of Iran to the international scene? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I, I do think mm -hmm. uh, that there is a change. Uh, Iran is, uh, is a regional power. There is no denying it. Uh, mm -hmm. By virtue of its size, uh, by virtue of its economics, and its economic potential with the sanctions gradually being lifted and uh, by virtue of its military which of course does not make its neighbors very happy but it's a fact of life uh, and if in fact the united states uh, grows closer to iran which seems to be the case it's it's very um it's very shaky it's very mm -hmm. tentative but with the U.S. and the West growing cr closer to Iran and recognizing Iran's right to nuclear enrichment, which has been formally recognized in this accord, yeah. um, it, it does alter the balance of power in the region. H having said that, yeah. I, I don't think that either Israel or, for that matter, Iran's Arabs na Arab neighbors mm -hmm. will allow Iran to go unchecked. Uh, I don't think that Iran will be allowed by its neighbors to accumulate vast, particularly military superiority. It's unfortunate, but I, I, I think in, in this case, what we might also anticipate beyond a change in the balance of power is uh, determination amongst the Arab states and, of course, amongst Israel, which, you know, has been guaranteed military superiority by the United States. Um, I think an arms race may be on the horizon. Well, Dr. Hale Vaziri, political analyst specialized in the Middle East and North Africa, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be with you and your listeners.